Hello everyone, I'm Audrey Galix and welcome to At The Table. Coming up, I'll be talking with Calvin Vismail, the new executive director of the Rainbow Push Coalition Peachtree Street Project in Atlanta. But first, my conversation with the founder of Rainbow Push, civil rights leader Jesse Jackson, whose visit to Atlanta in late August coincided with a date of great significance. August 28th is the anniversary of Dr. King's address in Washington at the mass gathering to end Jim Crow laws in the country, particularly in the South. Also, August 28th is the anniversary of the lynching of Emmett Till. And August 28th is also the date when President Barack Obama was uh, determined to be the Democratic nominee in Denver, Colorado in 2008. So it has certain meaning. It's, it's the Emmett Till, August 28th. This is March on Washington, August 28th. And the Dr. President Obama's uh, uh, declaration of his being nominated to the party on August 28th. So it has a certain, certain rhythm. And also, we've organized a thousand ministers around the country to put a renewed focus on activism. Uh, there is so much inclination to exalting the wealth and, and leaving the poor defenseless. And the minister's mission, of course, is to defend the poor and to heal the brokenhearted. To do that, they must be organized. That's what we're doing here today. And we've had a tremendous amount of broken hearts lately. You've had an opportunity to speak, for example, at so many funerals. I'm curious what well, kind of goes uh, through your mind when you're there. What, what uh, is the country's like? become increasingly violent with easier access to weapons. Some, um, there's a sense that there are those who, believe, who decry violence and yet fight for more access to guns with fewer background checks and will not ban assault weapons. And that's a contradiction if you're against violence to make these weapons less accessible. When the police were killed in um, Baton Rouge and in, uh, and in Dallas, they were killed with weapons that you could buy out the store at a gun show uh, uh, legally and for which the, the police have no defense for themselves not for the people. It seems to me to be irrational. So we must make a, a real challenge. The background checks is the, is the easiest step to take toward making our society less violent and less volatile. Uh, and so that is a concern. Uh, in, some, in these cities so often it's guns in. Uh, and drugs in and jobs out. So we need a complete reconstruction of policy that makes the life of people more livable. I was going to ask you what you think the major issues in the upcoming presidential election are, and I think you've hit on several just now. Well, it, right that. now it's a competition for name calling. At, at the end of the day, it has no value for the people who have the greatest needs. For example, in all the southern states except Louisiana, there's a resistance to the Affordable Health Care Act. South Carolina it would be a case in point. Here's a state that uh, a million of its citizens are uh, in poverty. They're Medicaid eligible. 250,000 have no health insurance at all. Yet a state with a, a $7 billion budget turns down $14 billion in Medicaid money on ideological grounds. Uh, there would be, that would be $14 billion in 60,000 jobs and keep rural medical centers open. The hospital the governor was born in, in Bamberg, South Carolina, has closed because of not receiving Medicaid money. That's an ideological decision. People need access to affordable health care. And so th that has to be an issue of substance. Uh, the second is if they, they decry people being poor, but then they fight against livable wages. Most people work every day, but they're the working poor. They work at fast food restaurants. They do day labor. They work eight to nine days, and they're laid off. So they'll not be a full-time employee and they're rehired again. That's just a work of manipulation. So in some sense, ministers come together to look at the issues that affect the working poor and, and defend the poor and defend the need and help those whose, whose backs are against the wall. And that is the great mission of the church. Beyond the church, you're also, understand, going to be working with some Morehouse students while you're in town regarding voter uh, registration? Voter registration is so critical. Uh, it's an extension of church work. You know, uh, if you're 17 years old and you'll be 18 by November the 8th, you're, you're eligible to vote in this election for the president of your choice 
a governor, so that's the case, may be a local judge, a local official. And so I would urge all high school principals to convene their 18-year-olds uh, and talk to them about citizenship. And you can have a, a voter registrar on your campus and register them. This can be their, their first participation in civics. Uh, all those who are in college, for example, already for the most part 18 or older, if they want to fight to, loot, to reduce student loan debt, for example, if they want to fight for issues of, 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 of civil justice, they should register and vote. I was talking to a group of youth in Ferguson, Missouri, oh, right after Michael Brown was killed, and the blood was still in the streets. And I said to them, let's, let's register and vote and turn pain to power. Some of their lack of protection was because they had not voted in the last election. So one guy said, the hell with voting, I'm not into that, I, I want to fight. So I said, if, if you were in the jury and the killer came to, to court, would you convict him? He said, I, I, would, I would convict him, I, I know he's the killer. I said, but only those who are registered can serve on juries. He said, oh, he didn't see a relationship between voting, registering to vote, and the jury. As you can also elect mayors who appoint police and fire chiefs. You can, you can elect state legislators, you can elect judges. He had no sense of, of, of the power of the vote and why people spend so much time trying to get it and others spend so much time trying to deny it. That's why the vote is so critical, because it, it, it can be next about 113,000 votes. That's one vote per precinct. Votes really have power. You know, that really is a segue to my one of the more philosophical questions. I mean, in some ways, you've gone from being a young firebrand, and in my you know, listening to you, uh, you sound like a, an older, wiser firebrand, not just an elder statesman in a sense. And I was wondering if, do you feel like the younger generation is, is listening to those words, is giving the older generation the due that's deserved? Well, <clears throat> there are some changeless values in changing times. Some things do not move that much. We, in, in 63, we were down, going up as if the wind was behind our back. Even in jail, there was a kind of sense that we were on the momentum. The day Dr. King gave the speech in Washington, that day, from most people here about the dream, the literary poetic climax of the speech, but from Texas across to Florida up to Maryland, we couldn't use a single public toilet. Uh, we couldn't sit in, in, the, in the public park and eat our food. We could not buy ice cream at Howard Johnson's. We could not rent a hotel room at Holiday Inn. Black soldiers had, and Latinos had to sit behind lots of prisons of war on American military bases. It was a barbarism and, and humiliation that day. And so we won that struggle uh, with discipline and, and determination. Uh, and then we had been denied the right to vote. But blacks couldn't vote for, since 1880, for 85 years. White women couldn't serve on juries for the most part across the South. 18 year olds could not vote, those serving in Vietnam at that time. Uh, you couldn't vote on college campuses, you couldn't vote bilingually. And so we brought about those changes for the whole, we brought the whole society into a new state of being. And because of those victories, there's a new South in many ways. You couldn't have had the Olympics in Atlanta behind the cotton curtain of segregation. You couldn't have had CNN in Atlanta. You couldn't have had the Carolina Panthers and the Atlanta Falcons behind the cotton curtain and the Atlanta Braves and, and the Dallas Cowboys behind the cotton curtain. And all the new industries in the South came because we pulled the walls down. The irony is, uh, astonishingly, is that the beneficiaries of that progress are reacting to it in, in a hostile ways. There's a kind of backlash today against progress, which is hard to explain. Remember the Southerners, at that time, tobacco was driving our economy, and agriculture was driving the economy, uh, and cotton. Now it's high tech, it's service industry and the like. And that's made possible because of the civil rights struggle. Then they, they say they're against the federal government intervention. Well, the interstate highways are federal, the new airports are federal, the seaports are federal, uh, the, the substitute universities are federal, the military base is federal, the penitentiaries are federal. This is uh, our land. We have every right to expect. So if you want federal money for highways and seaports, why not for poor people? Why not for Medicaid? And so that's an ongoing challenge. And in some sense, what young America is now facing is those who inherited freedom 
did not inherit equality. And now they are surprised and they're caught off guard with the backlash uh, to our freedoms. Now the Voting Rights Act is on the attack. Uh, working liberal wages for working people on the attack. Uh, a, lot, a lot more hostility in the climate because of leadership on the attack. But they're doing a good job. I, I must give those quote unquote Black Lives Matter credit for having the consciousness to stand up and not roll over, for stand up and fighting back. And they must be heard. They represent the voices of pain and the voices of conscience. <clears throat> and I understand that the upcoming conference that is going to be held uh, later this year will not only celebrate your 75th birthday and congratulations on reaching that milestone, but also focusing on the technology and um, the service industry. We're trying to get a thousand churches um, to put in some of them to Sunday school space during the week, a tech center, maybe 25 or 30 uh, computers to teach our children apps and codes and, and, and uh, stock market game, financial literacy, how to do robots. That's so basic, so fundamental to the, to the future. I mean, 20 million jobs by 2020 because of the industry. So that's a connection between Silicon Valley and our churches, uh, Silicon Valley and HBCUs. When we first went out there challenging Apple and HB and these companies to uh, hire black engineers, they went to UCLA and USC and they could not find them. Uh, they say they don't exist, they say, but they're over in HBCUs on the other side of the country in the South. 42% of all black engineers come from historical black colleges. They come from Morehouse and Spelman. They come from Texas Southern, Florida and m North Carolina A&T and, and Howard and Morgan State. That's where they come from. And so building a pipeline from Silicon Valley to HBCUs is a big deal, and, uh, as well as training our youth in the, the, the basic science of, of technology. It is learnable, it's doable, but it must be a priority. Looking over the arc of <clears throat> your experience from Dr. King's dream through the Black Lives Matter movement to even the hopes and dreams for young people going into high-tech industry, um, what do you believe is your greatest achievement, perhaps? And even on the flip side, maybe your greatest disappointment as well. <clears throat> well, I've been blessed to be a long-distance runner. Uh, seven classmates and I went to jail in 1960 trying to use a public library. And we never stopped from providing open libraries to open theaters and public facilities and blessed to be at the March on Washington to watch Dr. King give an address to be a part of that crowd of witnesses, uh, part of the struggle for the right to vote in Selma, Alabama. Uh, and then the painful moment of Dr. King's assassination. We were determined not to let one bullet stop a movement. We kept moving. And so from 68 to 08, we went from the balcony in Memphis, the balcony of the White House, President Barack Obama. We never stopped fighting. And I would like to think that uh, uh, continu continuing uh, uh, selfless service has been to me fulfilling and gratifying. I think the greatest disappointment has been given the progress that we've made, uh, how there's such resentment to the progress, why there's such an ugly backlash today. There's a kind of racial meanness today uh, that is attacking the dream. When you attack workers making livable wages, uh, that's attacking the dream. When you attack multiracial, multicultural gatherings, it's attacking the dream. We, we survived the part. We must now learn to live together, learn to live together. Uh, and, and I was in Baton Rouge a few days ago and there was great anxiety because the black, uh, Mr. Sterling had been killed by police and that was a reaction by blacks. Then police had been killed, the reaction by whites, and that was just kind of growing tension. Then the flood came. When the flood came, there you saw black and white together, paddling out of water together, lion and lamb lying together. In some sense, they had to transcend their fears and deal with their hopes <clears throat> getting out of that water together. And maybe, maybe that is the metaphor of our time. When the, storms, when the storms of life rage, we have to figure out how to paddle together. And, and I love that expression, <clears throat> then the flood came. And I'm curious, and I know I'm also conscious of the time limit that we have. What is your vision of the blessed community? We've talked about some of the ills, some of the hopes. Well, what does it look like? Take us there. Well, the blessed community really is uh, bottom up, not top down. Today, 
too few have too much to live in the excess, too many have virtually nothing living in the zone of desperation. And so the blessed community would be uh, a commitment to wipe out poverty and not wipe out the poor. Um, uh, most poor people work every day in one way or another. They, they may be day labor, they may, may be a cab driver, they may be cleaning someone else's house or cutting their grass, but they work every day. They work at some fast food restaurant, they catch their early bus, they raise other people's children, can't raise their own sometimes. But, but we, should be, we should have a floor beneath which no American falls. That was not the King's last campaign, the Poor People's Campaign, to uh, wipe out malnutrition, not the malnourished. Uh, to uh, have more emphasis on lifting our youth up rather than locking them up. Uh, a renewed emphasis on first class education for all of our children uh, and art and culture for their spirits. That we might lift ourselves up to a higher sense of self expectation. Many of our youth, unfortunately today, feel they jump up there, touch the basement. They feel that they're that deep in the hole. I was, Jennifer Hudson's uh, mother and brother were killed a few years ago. We went out in the streets in front of the house and had prayer one night, and I heard some footsteps coming. I looked up and some little game bangers were coming. I didn't quite know what to expect. I did not feel afraid. I just didn't know what to expect. And so one said, uh, Reverend, like, and he began to cry. The other one looked at me and said, we, we, need a, we just got out the joint. We need a gig. We just got out the joint. Now, I, I, as I embraced him, trying to figure out what to say, I looked down the street at the school. They go to school, they get five meals a week. They go back to jail, they get 21 meals a week. For them, jail is organized recreation and discipline, protection from street gun violence in the jail. Um, uh, there's warm in the wintertime, it's cool in the summertime. There's something wrong when there's more hope in jail community, where jail becomes a kind of um, uh, uh, jail hotel, where jail becomes a kind of uh, place for a reservoir for the mentally sick. In, in Chicago, 10,000 people in Cook County kind of Jail, 4,000 according to the sheriff, are mentally challenged. So just give them medicine all that to keep them quiet, keep them still. We, we deserve better than that as a society, and we can do better. Now we have some young people here who are with us. I was wondering if um, you'd like to offer any thoughts to them, any prayer, any, anything? Well, first of all, uh, youth is fleeing. You, you, can't, you can't lock it up. You must make the best of every day. Every day is connected to the next day and the, and, and the day before. And so don't self-destruct. Don't self-degrade. Use your mind and your spirit. Do the best you can to make an impact upon the society for the better. So when the role is called, you will have done your best to make an impact to have made your footprint in the sands of time. Young America has the strength, and there's no generational battle. There's an intergenerational battle. It's important that young people are connected to their, to their parents' fight. Part of our job is to do the unfinished business of the last generation, and to be able to weather the storm of, of a backlash against, against, against progress, and choose to go forward by hope, and not backwards by fear. Is there anything that I didn't ask that you, you asked everything? Address? I asked yeah. everything. No, though, I'll tell you one thing I, I didn't ask you about. You know, one one of the you know issues also with Jim Crow, et cetera. You and I couldn't go on a date. You know, just as much as I think one community is well, incarcerated well, in, well, in well, racism, we, of, we of, all of, suffered. Also, I mean, that is it's not relative. I'm just saying. Part of Jim Crow had eagles on one side of town and yeah. crows on the other. Yeah. Uh, and we could not develop. Like we put two seeds. We put two seeds in the ground of equal strength. You put a wall between them, and you water both. One will grow taller, and one will be stunted. Mm -hmm. The taller is not better. It's just that something called photosynthesis. It had the sunlight. When your walls come down, both of them can grow. And is it not a moment of joy to watch? when the Atlanta Falcons play on Sunday afternoon, uh, when you watch the Olympics where our youth uh, are able to uh, say, excel at the highest levels uh, from, from these sordid backgrounds, 
And the reason why we do so well on the athletic field, whether it's in, in Atlanta or in Rio, is that when the playing field is even and the rules are public and the goals are clear, and the referees are fair and the score is transparent, we can accept that. We can accept the outcomes. If we win, we win with glory. Even if we lose, we lose with dignity. And so we fight to equal the playing field for all people and let us achieve our highest and our best. If we do that, we can feel satisfied. We will have done our best. At the table, we'll return in a moment with the new head of Rainbow Push in Atlanta, Calvin Vismail Jr. Welcome back to At the Table, where we continue with a conversation with Calvin Vismail Jr., the new head of Rainbow Push in Atlanta. We, um, at the uh, Rainbow Push Coalition, uh, which also has an affiliate called the Citizenship Education Fund, which is a 501c3, um, under which we have the Peachtree Street Project and the Wall Street Project and the Silicon Valley Project. It's just a continuation of the work that uh, Dr. King and Reverend Abernathy assigned Jesse Jackson to 50 years ago uh, when they uh, asked him to head up uh, Operation Breadbasket in Chicago. And that was primarily, and we continue to, be, continue to be involved in economic equity, work of economic equity. Uh, Operation Breadbasket was implemented because of uh, certain economic injustices that were occurring on the south and west sides of Chicago. Uh, need for jobs, uh, a need for uh, business opportunities and engagement and trade. Um, we. Uh, implemented a process, or that process was implemented at that time, which we still use today, which is a very effective model. It's initiation uh, or identification. We identify uh, those organizations which we think uh, should be targeted because of their impact on our community. And also corporations. In this just... case, uh, it was uh, grocery stores, dairies, and bakeries. And at that time, Dairies were delivering milk on a daily basis. Grocery stores I remember those areas. had very thin uh, margins and still do, had thinner margins then. Uh, and, and those uh, organizations had multiple locations and outlets and, and, and interaction within our community, yet we've, we held very little jobs in those organizations. Uh, very few of those organizations did any business with our, our business community. So. Uh, the process is identification, uh, research, doing your homework to understand, you know, what the data points are, uh, then education and publication of that information, educating the community, uh, publishing the information, and then entering into a negotiation. If negotiations break down, then you move into the demonstration phase slash boycott phase, um, and then into the reconciliation phase. Uh, in those early days with Operation Breadbasket, because uh, grocery stores, dairies, and bakeries dealt in perishable goods, uh, it, it, it failed to be uh, long before a boycott had an economic impact on that organization and they would come to the table and then you would negotiate a covenant or an agreement between the community and that organization to provide more jobs, provide more opportunities to do business, um, and uh, jobs at different levels in the organization. So that was kind of the beginning of the of implementing the, the process or approach. And so the, now that occurs here in the Atlanta area and you're head of that, what have you seen as your, so, so to speak, priorities then in terms of either uh, entities to work with at this time? Well, we have uh, in our, what we call the New South Agenda, when we look at the demographics um, in Virginia around to Texas, 50%, 53% uh, or so of African Americans in the United States live in that region, in, in, in this region. We, uh, we look at the demographics in these individual states, uh, and we, uh, we look at our consumer dollars and where we spend them. 
So, and in looking at that, we have identified several public traded corporations in which uh, we represent a certain significant portion of their uh, consumer base. Um, we uh, do the research on them and we uh, intend to publish the research, educate our community as to what the data points are, and then we'll buy stock in those publicly traded companies. And we advocate from a shareholder standpoint, um, you know, how we think the company should be better. And in our research, we profile the companies as it relates to inclusion and diversity from the boardroom uh, on down through senior management, middle management. We look at the vendors, suppliers, uh, professional service providers, the attorneys, uh, investment bankers, asset management, you know, who's managing the pension fund, um, et cetera, et cetera. And, and then we rank them, uh, and, and then we uh, show up, if necessary, at the shareholder meeting and advocate for how the company can be better in the United States uh, of 2045. Uh, and how can the company continue to create shareholder value over time by having uh, more diverse uh, 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 yeah. views at the table, at the, at the boardroom, in terms of policymakers, in terms of management, in terms of uh, their vendor relations, in terms of uh, who provides them uh, their goods and services. I'm curious, as you interact perhaps with some of the younger people in the community, uh, perhaps even some of the leaders of the Black Lives Matter movement, how is that uh, accepted or how, how is that approach uh, considered among that constituency? Well, I think, number one, my experience with them so far has been, uh, uh, it's like uh, first seek to understand and then be understood. Gotcha. If you, if you mm -hmm. listen, uh, and then they, they will listen to you. Uh, in many cases, I have been approached and they ask, well, what should we be doing? What should we be thinking about? Uh, one young man approached me on uh, the, uh, the MARTA train, and he said... Were you wearing your rainbow push uh, Actually, I'm Actually, wondering. I was, and uh, talking with a classmate of mine from Morehouse College, and he approached us and he said, listen, um, you know, they affectionately refer to you as uncle or, or dad. <laughs> and uh, they said, you know, I'm angry about what's going on. However, what I do know is we need to understand what do we do next? What is the plan? I know that we need to have somebody who looks like you talking at, 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 in these other meetings that I can't get into because I look like this. So w what is it? How do we move the ball forward? I got to say, that's a pretty savvy young person. And guess what? We got to wrap it up on that. Let's talk more about that later. Thanks for joining us, Calvin Vismail of the Rainbow Push Coalition. Thanks for joining us, and thank you for joining us at the table. We'll see you next time.